Yes, thank you very much, Celia, for a very comprehensive introduction of the, the topic. Uh, and um, my title there, some of you will recognize from T.S. Eliot's Four Quartets, um, The Point of Intersection of the Timeless with Time is an Occupation for the Saint, he adds. Um, I, I want to talk about the one way out of our longing for the timeless. Uh, and I think it, the mystery here uh, um, is not a mystery about, about our own life and our longevity or, or anything like that. It's a mystery contained within time itself that we don't, uh, I think Mark touched on this when his, in his lovely discussion of Heidegger yesterday, that we don't actually uh, live in time in the way that objects are in time. Uh, and that we need to grasp this and perhaps wrench from it uh, what salvation we can. That's my thought. Uh, there's an, an ancient distinction that the Greeks make between, made between chronos and kairos. Um, chronos being the sequence of moments in which we uh, uh, move from one moment to the next and then and then and then, as we had repeatedly said. Kairos being that uh, the particular moment of application, the moment in which you are actually conscious of your being in time and uh, launching yourself or being uh, or in some way receiving uh, a sensation of your, uh, of your temporality through which you uh, as it were, grasp the time. So we live for, we, uh, we can understand this a little bit if we contrast living from moment to moment, which we all have to do, from living in the moment. There are people who live in the moment, uh, wanting to seize it, the carpe diem experience, and make that moment meaningful. Um, but, you know, that there is a, a living in the moment and also a living for the, the significant moments. And I think uh, we all of us have an awareness of that distinction too. And there are significant moments which are esteemed for what flows from them, because something good comes out of them. But there are also significant moments which bear their meaning in themselves. And this is the Kairos moment, uh, the, the look which uh, seizes you. Not, not um, a digital gaze, uh, but a, a straightforward look from one person to another. Uh, the look which is um, represented in the second theme of the overture to, no, the first theme of the overture to Tristan and Isolde. Right. Um, and and uh, these moments uh, are sometimes described as moments in and out of time. That's, again, T.S. Eliot's phrase. Um, they are the moments which are the kind of crux into which everything resolves and from which a new world seems to begin. Uh, and um, the word crux, of course, comes to us from the, uh, the crucial moment in our civilization, which was rep has been represented down the ages as the death of God himself. Um, this is an aesthetic idea as much as a religious one. You, know, you don't have to be religious or a believer in any particular uh, metaphysical framework to recognize the existence of these moments. And the aesthetic, I think, is, has become more and more important to us. Pasquale, I, th I think, touched on this earlier. Uh, the, the, the more the religious, as it were, passes from our consciousness over the horizon. We learn, as it were, to see these moments in another way. Uh, I, I wrote a book about this, Notes from Underground, uh, in which there's a character, Father Pavel, who has just this approach to, to life. He, he recognizes that in some way all meaning has been taken away by the situation, this was set in old communist Europe, or the situation in which he finds it himself. But still, there is this possibility of taking every moment, one after another, and everything one after another, and as it were, turning it, turning it around in, uh, in a, a purely imaginary space, to, so as to see its eternal side. Um, uh, and when you do this, you have a sense that perhaps there, our ordinary way of seeing things has an illusory side to it. Maybe, you know, uh, time, we often have this sense that time is in some sense illusory, that the reality of things must be outside time. That doesn't mean that it lasts forever, because if it's outside time, there is no before and after to it. There is another way completely of looking at it. And of course, Plato is famous for having tried to articulate that. Um, 
Nietzsche also tried to articulate this with the idea of eternal recurrence. Uh, and why did he hit on this idea? It seems weird to say that, that uh, we get eternity just by repeating everything. Well, there's a little poem, I think it's uh, um, inserted into Zarathustra, which has the lines, Alle Lust will Ewigkeit, will tiefer, tiefer, Ewigkeit. All joy wants eternity, wants deep, deep eternity. So eternity is, is understood here as depth, not extension. It's not as though it lasts forever. It's that, it's that you can look into it, and there's always more revealed below it, so to speak. Um, so a metaphor. Uh, and can we make sense of it? Well, um, traditional societies do try to make sense of, of this idea of, uh, of eternity by, through the practice of repetition. Rituals repeat things forever. Uh, uh, and um, th they implant in people's minds the thought that this is happening now because it happens always. You know, this is what a, a, a religious ritual is. Um, and, and it's what uh, ceremonies are. And, and that, this is why there's such a shock when rituals are changed. And that, that it's felt as, a, um, a, as a, a blasphemy or a desecration when you change, the, the, say, the words of the ritual or the gestures of it. You've polluted something. Um, and I'll say a few things about repetition here. I have to say this very quickly. Um, you're fitting your actions and your words and your thoughts to what has always been done. And it's the doing again that matters. But it's not you who are really doing it. That's the thought in, in, these, uh, in ordinary religious uh, rituals. Your action is a representation of something else which occurs timelessly. And that, you see this idea in the, the um, medieval book of hours, the, you know, where, where you sit there and you, you as were, in, indicate the passing of hours to yourself as something which is not passing in you, but passing eternally. Um, uh, Rilke wrote a little book, the St uh, Stundenbuch, which is a, uh, you know, a book of hours. I mean, it's, it's a nice little poem, which there it is in English. I love the dark hours of my being. My mind deepens into them. There I can find, as in old letters, the days of my life already lived and held like a legend and understood. This idea that, then that while living in time, you're looking into every moment and seeing something as it were, the other side of it, which is the representation of that moment in eternity. So you're invoking something, making it present bring, um, through these meditations, bringing it down among us. It's what uh, in religion, is some, uh, in the Christian religion, is indicated as the, the real presence. Uh, this is the fundamental religious experience. You might call it the, the present tense of absence. You know, that, that, that uh, you're bringing into the present moment something which is eternally not available in the here and now. And Nietzsche saw this. I think that's what his, his uh, idea of eternal recurrence is. But he didn't know what to do with it. Wagner also saw it and, and uh, wrote his famous opera Parsifal as an attempt to show a, a totally ritualized community seeking salvation by turning... Uh, every moment around so as to see the other side of it. But, but um, this community has been polluted by too much attachment to the here and now and therefore demands the act of sacrifice that will rescue it. Uh, and we see this in the daily the religions which, which command uh, things that you do at the time of the day, the daily times of prayer for the Muslims. The Muslim calendar is like this and the, the Hajj, the pilgrimage, um, and I think that's how we should see these, these uh, aspects of religion. But of course, we individualists, the people in this hall, in this, in this room, it can't really rest content with this. Uh, meaning for us can't just be doing the same thing as everyone else over and over again. We know that each of us is much better than the rest of the people in the room, and we have our own life to live, and, it's going to, and we're going to be redeemed by our individuality. Um, so we, we've availed ourselves of an idea of the transcendental, that, that, that we can individually confront something else. Uh, and so one way of seeing the moment in and out of time is in terms of the transcendental. Here we stand at the edge, so to speak, facing outwards into that uh, infinite void. 
but about the transcendental, nothing can directly be said. On the other hand, the temptation is to speak about it nevertheless. The only philosopher who has not given in to this temptation was Wittgenstein, as you know, at the, who ended the Tractatus by saying, that whereof we cannot speak, we much, must consign to silence. Uh, and he was very good at, at silence, uh, unique among philosophers. Um, but we are always tempted to speak of it nevertheless, uh, because, uh, because of this sense that, there, that the, the temporal ultimately doesn't grant us the experience of meaning that we're looking for. We're always wanting that uh, the atemporal thing which will show the meaning of everything. So is the concept of the transcendental empty? Uh, and I, my view is it isn't, but it is, so, so to speak, the idea of, um, uh, we've been given the idea of a one-sided boundary. We can go up to that boundary from one side, but we can't go across it. This is uh, Kant's vision in the Critique of Pure Reason, uh, and I, I think it's a very persuasive vision, that our world is, as it were, contained within an envelope, uh, uh, which is finite, uh, but there is no path through that envelope to the thing beyond. And yet, nevertheless, it's part of our nature uh, as meaning-hungry beings that we go up to the edge of that boundary and stare into the void beyond it. And we look for ways in which we can, as it were, stand there at the window uh, and through that standing there absorb some sense uh, that indeed there is an eternal meaning to the things that are happening to us in time. And this is really what art, I think, uh, part of what art does. Uh, it can bring us to this point and keep us there at the window. Things then come together for us as they do in tragedy and suffering and contingency are redeemed. That's mean, I mean, rescued from their inherent meaninglessness. Uh, and um, these, I think I might just skip that. Um, death is the, one of the important ways in which this come, uh, becomes vivid to us. And this is a, I don't know whether you can see this, this is um, Poussin, one of Poussin's representations of the sacraments, extreme unction, the sacrament that is given to the uh, mortal being at death. Um, in the sense that here, you know, all these beings are standing at the edge, looking out, uh, into the transcendental and it's death that has brought that experience to them and therefore death has to be made into a, a sacrament as to say a vision of something sacred uh, in tragedy you have uh, uh, death is made sacred in a similar way um, this is a, a, a 19th century picture by Nikophoros proof that the, the Greeks were actually quite uh, on the ball in the 19th century um, uh, of the, the, the visiting of Antigone to her dead brother's body uh, about to, in her attempts to bury it, um, which of course leads to her, her death. Um, tragedy is a sort of uh, representation of, of the Kairos moment for us. Uh, and many philosophers, Aristotle especially, have had this great question, what explains the peculiar sense of peace and reconciliation? that attends the tragic experience, or not always, but often does. This is where uh, people like Wagner talk of Erlösung, redemption, that somehow you, there's a redemption that we uh, obtain through confronting the death of the hero, recognizing the, the human possibility. Here is a hero that's gone up to the edge of things and gone over the edge into, into nothingness, and yet somehow we are rescued by this. It's not a, a, a rukkauf, a, a buying back, it's a, a freeing uh, of, of things, a loosening of things. Likewise, in, in Proust's book, The Recherche du Temps Perdu, there's a reaching back to, all, to those moments which have left us, as it were, with a sense of a meaning that has not yet been obtained. A reaching back and rescuing of things. And that's what Antigone is doing uh, in burying her brother Polynices. She's rescuing him from meaninglessness uh, it, at the moment of his death, consecrating that death so that the life uh, which led to it is also uh, redeemed or rescued. 
And this is, uh, uh, Ray talked about the way in which art gives us a kind of completion to our experience. It gives us the full version of the, of the fragments that we otherwise um, uh, uh, would have. A, a perfected attention, he said, an existential plenitude. And I think those are important. But I think it also uh, brings, and tragedy especially, brings the perception of the absolute value of the individual, uh, um, uh, uh, which is what Antigone expressly puts before us, and of the self-consciousness, the I, as a kind of gift. And I'll just sort of end with these words, because I'm not persuaded um, by, by, by all that stuff about the self, I have to say. Um, I don't think there is such a thing as the self, but I do think that we all have um, a first-person perspective on things. There is uh, a way of... Uh, we are addressing ourselves in the first person when we use the word I, um, but the I is not something, an object in the world. It's a perspective on the world. Uh, and that's where the depth of the subject comes to for me. It lies always behind and beneath the objects in which we search for it. Uh, and I think this is why the, uh, a creature that sees itself as I, identifies itself in the first person, is never satisfied with chronos time. He doesn't, in, 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 in his depth, he doesn't see himself or herself. The very fact that it's gendered is a, is a bore at this moment, uh, but that doesn't, um, let's say, doesn't see himself as being taken along from moment to moment. Uh, each, as soon as he identifies himself as I, he has singled out that moment as in some, some way uh, intimately connected with his very existence. It's the moment of this point of view, the moment from which the decision is taken. Uh, and this is why we have a sense that somehow uh, our inner life uh, is organized in time in a different way. This is what Bergson thought in his um, philosophy of duration, that, it, that this inner life is a bound up stretch of time. It's not a succession of moments. It's bound into, uh, into me and in my present self-consciousness, uh, it, it is there as, the, as a arrival experience of being in time. And we have the same sort of experience in music. And that is why when, when uh, people die, we think that there is a genuine existential change. When, if I were to cut my horse Desmond in two, it would be a mistake, um, of course. But there'd be two bits of a horse instead of one bit of a horse. Um, and Desmond indeed would have died. There would be an organic complexity that, that had, uh, that had um, been replaced by two, de two decaying things. But it wouldn't be the same uh, as the death of a self-conscious being. When I, when I die, something goes out of existence irreparably, uh, which, is, uh, which is of infinite importance to me. Uh, and, and so that and this is why we think that a human death is such a revelation uh, of a different order of time. The thing, that's what Poussin was trying to express in that uh, incredibly dramatic picture, that something has happened here which has shaken the universe. Something has gone out of existence uh, irreparably, which has left a different universe after it. In other words, that this was a moment in which um, the, uh, that other form of time, the time which is... In its, which is a lost in eternity, is, has been made present. It is made present through the absence uh, of the I in that, um, in that dead body. Well, those are, those are my thoughts. I know that they're, they're very confused, but they're my attempt to say that maybe, it's, of course it's true that we can't obtain immortality, even if we were Kurtz, Kurtzweil, uh, you know, some, somebody's going to turn that machine off. Um, and the sooner the better. Um, but um, so the lo longing for immortality in the sense of going on further and further in chronos time must be uh, both mistaken and anyway impossible to fulfill. So it must be the case that our longing in these matters is for something else. Uh, it's, for, it's for that kind of eternity which can be a real presence in time. Thank you.